Over the years, the name of John Brown has invoked many different feelings across the nation, from adoration from the abolitionists to condemnation from the southern population, especially the Virginians. And yet, the event that catapulted John Brown into a position of prominence is not talked about in significant detail, that event being his famous, or infamous, raid on the armory at Harper's Ferry. In this video, I seek to rectify this by discussing the events leading up to the raid, the raid itself, the fallout of this raid, and why this raid was simply a terrible idea. First, let's discuss the mastermind behind the raid, John Brown. John Brown was born May 9, 1800 in Torrington, Connecticut, before his family moved to Hudson, Ohio. When he turned 16, he returned to New England, first stopping in Massachusetts and then back to his birth state of Connecticut for his education before returning to Ohio at the age of 19. During his time there, he started his own tannery business, a profession that his father had been in for decades, and struggled financially for much of his adult life. He would bounce around from Ohio, Massachusetts, and New York throughout those years, often becoming engaged with the abolitionists in those areas. At this time, it would seem that John Brown would be more like the average abolitionist of his time, opting to help slaves escaping to freedom to find a better life. However, this would change dramatically in 1855 as his sons, who were living in Kansas, summoned their father to assist them in defending their stakes in the increasingly violent territory. During this time, numerous groups were settling in the new territory after it was opened up for settlement, much of which was driven by abolitionists and slave-owning groups. The reason why stems from the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which would determine the legality of slavery by a vote upon the acceptance of the territory as a state. This inevitably led to conflict between the two groups, which rapidly descended into violence. In 1856, the town of Lawrence, Kansas, saw an outburst of violence between the pro-slavery and abolitionist groups, resulting in the sack of the town. This event led to John Brown seeking revenge for the attack, which led to the infamous Potawatomi Massacre. In this act of violence, John Brown, along with five of his sons and several others, went out on the night of May 24, 1856, to the houses of those he suspected of participating in the sacking of Lawrence. He and his band would go to their homes in the middle of the night, and subsequently murder those he found suspect. In the end, five men were killed, three of whom John Brown personally murdered in execution style. This act, for many years, was denied by those who wanted to absolve John Brown of any such sins, but it would come out to be the case as one eyewitness of this event, James Townsley, who went with John Brown that night, came forth with his testimony. The bloodshed in Kansas only radicalized John Brown further in his abolitionist beliefs, turning a staunch abolitionist into a true zealot of the moral cause, one that would go as far as to argue that they were in a state of war, requiring bloodshed to achieve their moral cause. It is this radical view that would ultimately lead to him leaving Kansas and setting up shop just outside of Harper's Ferry, Virginia, to prepare for something that would only escalate the whole situation, the planning of a full-on slave revolt. In late 1858 and early 1859, John Brown began planning a raid of Harper's Ferry as the opening stage of a major slave revolt. The reasoning for why he selected Harper's Ferry comes down to one major fact. It had a U.S. military armory in the town, which came into being as a result of the numerous railway lines that went through the town, thus making it a major location for the transportation of both wartime and peacetime materials in the 1850s. The weapons seized from the armory would then be used by John Brown and his supporters in order to arm the enslaved population in the area and encourage a full-on slave revolt, one that he hoped would be controlled by him and his sympathizers 
as an organized movement. In 1858, as part of the preparation for the raid, he'd write a draft for a constitution of sorts that would serve as the governing document for said group. At the same time, he would organize with two of his sons and 19 other men who would assist in the raid on Harper's Ferry. On July 3rd, 1859, John Brown would arrive at Harper's Ferry, staying five miles north on the Kennedy Farm. There, he would train the 21 men who had volunteered in assisting him in his effort to prosecute the war he wished to wage. In order to dissuade attention from being drawn, most of the training would be conducted at night while his band of men would hide up in the attic of the Kennedy House during the day, doing whatever they could to pass the time. At the same time, John Brown's daughter, Annie Brown, and Oliver Brown's wife, Martha, would distract the neighbors in whatever way they could while doing other tasks for the men there, such as preparing food, and washing their clothing. This would go on throughout the rest of the summer into the early fall. However, by early October, John Brown had deemed that the time had come to begin his raid. Before John Brown would begin his raid, he'd lead a prayer with his men. Based on the man's character, I believe it went something like this. Blood for the blood god! Blood for the blood god! Blood for the blood god! On October 16th, after praying to whatever deity he might have been praying to, John Brown and his men set off to Harper's Ferry at 8 p.m. By 10 p.m., they had secured the railway bridges leading into Harper's Ferry which cut off the Baltimore and Ohio's railroad route across the Potomac River, as well as other railway lines in the area. By 12 a.m. on October 17th, John Cook, one of John Brown's men, would lead several others to capture Lewis Washington, the great-grandnephew of George Washington and John Alstad, subsequently freeing the slaves under their charge. They also took into their possession some of George Washington's relics, including a saber gifted to Washington by Frederick the Great of Prussia, which would allegedly be worn by John Brown during the raid. At 1.25 a.m., a B&O passenger train is stopped at the bridge by John Brown's men, prompting one of the night watchmen hired by the B&O, Hayward Shepard, a free black man, to investigate. One of John Brown's men would shoot him, mortally wounding the man. Between 4 and 5 a.m., the hostages already taken by John Brown and John Cook are moved to the Armory Fire Engine House and kept there. At the same time, John Brown takes hostage employees working at the Armory as they report to work, not knowing the situation at hand. By 7 a.m., the situation escalates further as townspeople, realizing the scale and scope of the situation, begin taking out their arms and start firing at the raiders. In the sporadic gunfight, John Borley, a grocery man living in Harper's Ferry, is killed by return fire from the raiders. By 10 a.m., John Brown's raiders are surrounded by a local militia quickly raised up to stop him, cutting off any escape routes and confining them to the armory. In the ensuing gunfight, the first raider, Dangerfield Newby is shot dead while another raider is captured under a flag of truce sent by John Brown. By the noon of the 17th, two more of John Brown's raiders are shot carrying a second flag of truce. At 1 p.m., a fourth raider is shot and killed trying to escape across the Potomac River, a man by the name of William Lehman. By 2 p.m., the situation escalates further as the U.S. Rifle Works is stormed by the local militia. John Coggy and Jim are killed while Raider Lewis Leary is mortally wounded in their attempt to escape across the Shenandoah River. Two more Raiders, John Copeland and Ben, are captured. At the same time this occurred, the mayor of Harper's Ferry, a man by the name of Fontaine Beckham, is shot and killed as he ventured unarmed too close to the ensuing gunfight. In a fit of rage, a mob that had been growing since the morning finds William Thompson, who had been captured under the first flag of truce four hours prior, and subsequently murder him before tossing his body into the Potomac River. By 3 p.m., the militiamen free most of the hostages taken by John Brown, 
forcing Brown and his men to flee to the engine house. By dark, the situation in Harper's Ferry was a scene of madness, as hundreds of militiamen packed the streets of the small crossroads town. In the confusion, Raiders Albert Hazlitt and Osborne Anderson managed to leave the arsenal and escape across the Potomac. However, a ninth Raider, Stuart Taylor, is shot and killed. Meanwhile, on the Maryland side of the Potomac, Raiders Owen Brown, John Cook, Barclay Kopak, Francis Miriam, and Charles Tidd escape into the hills and evade capture or death. By 11 p.m., 90 U.S. Marines arrive by train from Washington, D.C., under the command of Colonel Robert E. Lee, along with Lieutenant James Yule Brown Stewart, better known as Jeb Stewart, who acted as Lee's aide-de-camp. In the early morning hours of the 19th of October, 1859, Oliver Brown, one of John Brown's sons, dies. At 7 a.m., shortly after dawn, Lieutenant Jeb Stewart asks for their surrender, only to be rebuffed by Brown. Shortly after this, the 90 U.S. Marines storm into the engine house, where one Marine is killed while another is wounded. In the ensuing chaos, Lieutenant Israel Green assaulted John Brown directly, beating him with his saber. One such blow was deflected by the belt buckle of the sword John Brown had taken from Lewis Washington the previous day. In the end, two more raiders were killed, two more surrendered, and two further raiders were captured in the quick, decisive fight in the engine house. The raid was officially over, but not before spilling the blood of sixteen people, ten coming from the raiders alone. John Brown was held in custody and placed on trial for treason against Virginia late in October, where he and his lawyer testified in their defense. In this, his lawyer, Samuel Chilton, pled to insanity by using John Brown's constitution he'd penned in 1858 as evidence for his insanity. However, this was not enough. John Brown was found guilty and sentenced to hang. On December 2nd, 1859, on the day of his execution, John Brown said the following, I, John Brown, and I am quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. The fallout of the raid would lead to a great controversy, dividing the nation even further than it already had. Those supporting the abolitionists' cause would champion John Brown as a hero, elevating him and deifying him as a champion of their moral cause. This deification can best be seen in the Thomas Hovenden painting The Last Moments of John Brown, where Brown is portrayed in a similar fashion as Jesus Christ being led to his crucifixion. However, from the viewpoint of the Virginians and the South as a whole, they saw John Brown as an insurrectionist, a madman so convicted in his cause that he'd willingly put innocent lives at risk in order to achieve his alleged moral right. For instance, when recounting the events of that night, Israel Green, having served in the Confederate Marines during the war, would make several references back to Oswatomi, another engagement that occurred in the Kansas Territory that Brown had been involved in, taking place shortly after the Potawatomi Massacre, and had earned Brown the dubious nickname of Oswatomi Brown. In fact, Jeb Stuart, who would go on to become one of the greatest Confederate cavalrymen of the war, had allegedly recognized John Brown because he had served in Kansas during the time of Brown's infamous deeds there. Outside of the military brass, the general population of the South saw him as an insurrectionist, someone seeking to bring about absolute chaos within Virginia and elsewhere in the South by starting slave revolts. Such is the negative image of Brown that, in the South, even today, Virginians often have little, if anything, good to say about Brown and a considerable amount of criticism to heap upon the man. This leads to an important question. Whose perspective is closer to the truth, 
who here is right with their conclusions on John Brown and his raid. Based on the research I have done over the years, I would argue that the southern perspective of John Brown is closer to the truth, though still flawed for at least one important reason. John Brown was not merely insane. John Brown was an ideological extremist. He had taken a pledge to destroy slavery at all costs, meaning that he was willing to throw away any moral scruples he felt out the window in pursuit of his cause. His judgment was not weighed upon the virtues of the man, but on one specific point, the question of one's opinion on slavery. In the case of Potawatomi, he murdered William Sherman, whom he didn't have any real evidence that he had participated in the raid on Lawrence, simply for not providing adequate enough answers to satisfy him. It was the cold-blooded nature in which he murdered those he even suspected of guilt that made him worse than someone who's insane. An insane man lashes out without any real rationale for his actions. John Brown, however, was deliberate and ruthless. The actions of such a ruthless man were only escalated even further with the planning of his raid at Harper's Ferry, and his ultimate goal of starting a revolution, of sorts, to free the enslaved population. What John Brown had planned, what John Brown wanted, was an outright slave revolt. Slave revolts, in the eyes of most people in the modern-day world, are romanticized as freedom fighters and seen as a good thing, but the truth of these affairs is far more ugly and horrific. After John Brown began his raid, alarm bells had gone off throughout Virginia, prompting the mass mobilization of militia units throughout the Commonwealth. In Richmond, militia units were raised on the order of Governor Henry Wise. His son, future Virginia Governor John Sergeant Wise, had relayed the scene in Richmond where the entire thing had caused a small uproar. This rapid mass mobilization of Virginia's militia was not coincidental, nor was it accidental. This was something that had been planned and prepared for because of previous slave revolts and their considerable toll upon the lives of innocent men, women, and children. The last major revolt took place in 1831 when Nat Turner, a fervently religious slave, had led a number of slaves in an armed revolt where 50 white men, women, and children, the youngest being less than a year old, were systematically killed, while over 120 slaves and freedmen were killed, many being the revolting slaves. In Nat Turner's confession, recorded shortly before his execution on November 11, 1831, he testified the following. As we pushed on to the house, I discovered someone run round the garden, and thinking it was some of the white family, I pursued them, but finding it was a servant girl belonging to the house, I returned to commence the work of death. But they whom I left had not been idle. All the family were already murdered, but Mrs. Whitehead and her daughter Margaret. As I came round to the door, I saw Will pulling Mrs. Whitehead out of the house, and at the step he nearly severed her head from her body with his broad Acts. Miss Margaret, when I discovered her, had concealed herself in the corner, formed by the projection of the cellar cap from the house. On my approach, she fled, but was soon overtaken, and after repeated blows with the sword, I killed her by a blow on the head with a fence rail. Slave revolts, in general, were horrific bloody affairs resulting in the deaths of countless innocent lives, where guilt was judged purely by association of skin color. Even if you could argue John Brown never intended for such things, had his raid been successful, the end result would have been countless innocent lives lost 
for no gain. Most important of all, the aftermath of slave revolts often made the lives of the enslaved worse. After Nat Turner's revolt, the lives of the enslaved population were further regulated, prompting legislation strictly controlling the education of slaves on the state level, out of fear of another Nat Turner coming about and butchering more innocent lives. John Brown wanted to spill blood. He wanted a war. It is this bloodlust that turns John Brown from a misguided hero to a truly villainous character. He was no saint, but a demon wearing saintly clothing. For those few who still insist that John Brown was still fighting for a good cause absolves him of these sins, there is an old proverb that often comes to mind. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions don't absolve sins. John Brown is not an exception to the rule. He is the rule.